We're in Mark chapter 15, and as you, you go there, we're really kind of starting to wrap up our series in Mark, and um, the last couple of weeks have been especially meaningful to me. I was talking with Jason and, and Vaughn uh, earlier in the week, uh, two separate conversations, similar context, but I hate to even admit this because it sounds like I've been negligent, and maybe it, maybe it reveals that I have, but... 15 years as a pastor, that's a lot of sermons. That's, that's a lot of sermons. And I've never preached verse by verse through the crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Preached many sermons on those things, but never verse by verse through a book that deals with it, through a text that deals with it. And so this has been especially meaningful to me, especially in light of everything that we've learned in the Gospel of Mark. And everything that we've learned the last couple of weeks. Jesus was dehumanized by the scourge. His vision so marred, Isaiah 52 and 14, his personage so disfigured that he was unrecognizable. Dehumanized on the cross. He was degraded, made fun of, maligned, spit on, his hair pulled, all leading toward the crucifixion. And, and, and we know in the church, that there is triumph in that suffering, that through that suffering, atonement has been made, justice has been satisfied, mercy has been granted, and we have access into that grace by faith in his name. Thank God for that. Amen? And now that Christ has been crucified and he has died, there is this interlude, the storm that began in Gethsemane when he sweat blood lulls in the grave. And we have this interlude, three days of waiting. And we get the sense that even in heaven there was a, a somber tone that hung in the air while Jesus was in the grave, only to be broken by thunderous applause three days later. Don't you know that was true? That they all waited with bated breath, anticipating what God would do in three days. And when Jesus rose from the grave, you can imagine the roar of those angels in heaven. Can you not? It gives me chill bumps if I think about it too long. But for now, we need to focus on this interlude in the grave, this three days. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I find it fascinating that Mark actually writes more detail about Jesus' burial than he does about the act of Jesus being scourged. When he mentions Jesus being scourged, beaten before the cross, that, that passes with a simple phrase. He writes more about Jesus' burial than he does about the act of crucifying Jesus. He simply says they crucified him, and that unceremoniously passes through our reading. Mark writes more details about his burial than he does about those two things that we so often talk about in connection with his death that we rarely communicate in our day his burial as a pivotal part of the gospel and that really is why and, and i want you to understand that before we begin the, the scriptures go into more detail about jesus burial than the scourging and the crucifixion for a good reason that it is evidence that jesus actually died and that his death forms that integral part and that is verified evidentially by his burial and so his burial then forms a, a crucial part of the gospel message something that we're going to talk about in great detail today and so as we reflect upon that i want to read our text in mark chapter 15 verse 42 through 47 down through the end of the chapter and as we read there, verse 42, and when evening had come, so Jesus has been on the cross for about six hours before he dies. And so as, as it, the day wanes, the Sabbath, if you were a Jew, begins at sundown. And so something's got to be done before the sun sets and the Sabbath starts. Since it was the day of preparation, that's the day before the Sabbath, it's very clear there in verse 42, verse 43, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council who was also 
himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died and summoning the centurion, the same one who, when Jesus dies and sees the manner of his death, cries out, truly, this was the Son of God, same centurion. He calls the centurion and he asks him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse. That's a very brusque term for Jesus' body, don't you think? But again, it supplies us with some evidence that Jesus was actually dead. Pilate grants the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph brought uh, a bought a linen shroud, rather, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, remember them, they were those loyal women who stood at the cross watching Jesus as he died. They saw where he was laid. That's a very all, a crucial bit of information as well. But so let's focus, and as we reflect on the burial of Jesus, to, to really understand it, we need to talk about Joseph of Arimathea's. Before we do that, though, let's pray, okay? Bow with me, please, and, and let's ask the Holy Spirit's help to understand the scriptures this morning. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the testimony that it bears in our lives about Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for uh, testifying to us in our hearts and our minds about Jesus, even right now as we read these words. Help us to understand how crucial his burial was. After the cross, before the resurrection, that three-day period forms a critical part of the gospel message. And so I pray that you would drive that deep down within our hearts, and, and Father, that you would equip us to better share the gospel, that, that you would give us a better understanding of, of what it means to us as Christians, who we are in Christ, and the hope that we have in Jesus. Be glorified today in our Bible study, just as you were in our songs. Be glorified in our fellowship after the service as we eat together with glad hearts. We rejoice in you and your blessing for us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we reflect on Jesus' burial, we need to really understand a couple of things first. And, and the first is we need to wrap our minds around Joseph of Arimathea, this, this man we're introduced to in our text. And, and so as we begin to put this together, the pieces together uh, surrounding Jesus' burial, I want you to notice with me the hidden faith of a closeted disciple. That's number one. And as, as we kind of unpack who Joseph was and, and what he did, it kind of helps us understand the role that Jesus' burial plays in the gospel, okay? And so let's talk about the details. Let's consider the details revealed by the Scripture and their purpose, including Joseph of Arimathea here, okay? We know that Jesus died about 3 in the afternoon. He'd been on the cross for about 6 hours. Darkness had hung that last 3 hours from noon to 3. He dies at 3, and so Jesus has been hanging there for some time, and as the, the day wanes in the late hours of the afternoon, we're introduced to Joseph of Arimathea, who appears before Pilate asking for the body of Jesus. Now, I find it fascinating that the Scripture reveals to us more about the kind of man that Joseph is before it ever tells us about what he does. Do you notice that in the text? Several details are given to us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God preserving these words forever for us about him, what kind of man he was, his character, his faith, before we're ever told about what he does. So much really could be said about him, so let's kind of unpack this. First, you see that he was a member of the council. Really, that means that he was a member of the Sanhedrin, that 70-member ruling council of the Jews. By the way, if you're kind of taking inventory in your mind, this was the same group of men that condemned Jesus to death 
in, in Mark chapter 14, verse 64. Same group of men. We see that he was respected member of the council, meaning that he had a good reputation, uh, that he was a, a moral man, an upstanding man, that he, that he was an ethical man is really what that term implies, that he was respected. But when you put this together with the other Gospels, in particular Luke 23, 50, and 51, there the Bible adds that he was a righteous man and that thankfully he had not consented to the death of Jesus Christ with the others. Most commentators, most Bible scholars believe that he and Nicodemus refused to be present. They would not be called to that trial because you remember, they broke their own law by having that trial at night outside of the temple. Should never, never have been had in the first place. And so because Joseph of Arimathea was a good and righteous man, having an, an ethical, moral reputation, we can safely say he had no part in that illegal, unjust trial where they condemned Jesus to death. So we know that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. We also know that he was a religious man. That's letter B if you're following along in your outline in the app or in the bulletin. He was a religious man. We know that he was looking, the scripture says, for the kingdom of God. It says something about him. He had to be religious as a member of the council, but when he was looking for the kingdom of God, that same testimony was given of Anna, the prophetess at Jesus' birth, and Simeon. They were looking for the kingdom of God. That means that he was well acquainted with the Old Testament scriptures that prophesied Messiah coming and restoring the kingdom of Israel. And we know in the mind of Jewish people in that culture, they had kind of blended the two comings, the, the, the first advent of Christ where he would come and die for the sins of the world, the second advent of Christ when he would come and restore the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of David. They had kind of blended those two in their own minds. Joseph had probably done very much the same thing. Interestingly, Matthew and John record for us that he was really a disciple of Jesus. Matthew 27, 57. But for fear of the Jews, he didn't want to be excommunicated. He kept his opinions about Jesus to himself. John 19 and 38. So he was a closeted disciple. So too was Nicodemus at this point. So we put all that together and we realized that he was well acquainted with the scriptures that he was faithfully looking for the kingdom of God, and he had found that in Jesus. But when Jesus was crucified, all of those hopes that he had put in the basket of Jesus were shattered. And his heart was broken. And yet his actions now in his death reveal great, deep, authentic faith, don't they? So we know from the text that he was a member of the Sanhedrin, that he was a religious man. Here's letter C. He was a courageous man as well. At least now he was. That something changes when Jesus dies. That, that he takes courage and he goes to Pilate and he asks for the body of Jesus. He goes to the same man who sentenced Jesus to death, who had Jesus flogged, scourged, beaten within an inch of his life. He goes to the same man who had Jesus crucified. And, and so that took a great amount of courage, don't you think? Once more, when he asked for the body of Jesus, that was something that the Romans didn't do. They did not release bodies of executed prisoners. As a matter of fact, they didn't even bury them. There was no common grave where they threw them in um, they weren't given a release to family and friends so that family and friends could see to their burial what the romans did with bodies of executed prisoners was throw them in the dump it would be like us taking a dead loved one out to the waste management area out there on our breakers you know what i'm talking about and just just you know power sliding the rear end of our pickup around the corner and kicking them out and driving off. That's, that's the same kind of contempt that the Roman soldiers had for these bodies of executed prisoners. And so they would take 
bodies down from the cross, if they took them down at all, sometimes they would, depending on the crime that was committed, leave them up there until they decomposed and literally fell down on their own as a deterrent to future crimes. But if they took them down, they would take them to Gehenna, the garbage dump outside of Israel in the Valley of Hinnom. You remember that place? Jesus used that place as a metaphor for hell in Mark 9, 42 and 49. That's the place where Jesus said the worm is never quenched, never satisfied. The fire does n- never goes out. That it's, it's a place of eternal darkness. And so they would take bodies down from the cross and in this, this show of contempt and disrespect, they would throw them in the garbage dump. So that said, what does that tell us about Joseph? It's a bold move, is it not? It's a decisive act on his part to go and ask for the body of Jesus because this publicly associates him with Jesus now who has been crucified, convicted, and crucified as a seditionist, somebody who you know, stood up against imperial Rome. That was why Pilate put him to death. Touching the dead body would have made him unclean, ceremonially unclean, which meant that he could not celebrate Passover on High Sabbath, which was coming on the next day. And so all of these little things kind of rise to the surface, and we realize that those things that mattered to him as a religious man and as a member of the council, all of a sudden they didn't matter anymore. Because faith seems to take over. And though he didn't have the courage to follow Jesus in his life, he had the courage to go and take Jesus' body and minister to him in his death. That is a powerful thing, loved one. That's, that that, that the, the switch flipped, if you will. The light bulb went off and that faith rises in his heart. And so when Joseph asks for Jesus' body to be released, into his care, we see faith rising. That he's willing in Jesus' death to be associated with him. His reputation as a member of the council doesn't matter anymore. His ceremonially, uh, un- un- ceremonial uncleanness doesn't matter anymore. That all that matters is that he take care of Jesus. And so when he asks, Pilate's surprised. I, I find that amusing considering everything that Pilate had done to Jesus leading up to the crucifixion. But he's surprised that Jesus is dead already. And and after conferring with the same centurion that stood at the cross, verse 39, Pilate granted Joseph's request. The corpse, as I said, that's a very brusque word, a very detailed word, is taken down from the cross and handed over to Joseph for burial. Now what is interesting at this point is that Joseph goes to great lengths to give Jesus a proper burial. He is not treated as a criminal, not by the Romans and not now by a member of the ruling council of the Jews. And if you put all of the synoptic gospels together, you get all this this complete picture that what Joseph does with, with the help of Nicodemus is... A tremendous act of faith, revealing the heart of a true disciple who is willing to take up his cross and deny himself and follow Jesus in his death. We see that Nicodemus, as I mentioned a moment ago, who himself was another closeted, secret disciple, kind of shows up according to John chapter 19 and verse 39. Joseph buys a linen shroud, which were linen cloths that were used to wrap the body. They were wrapped tightly and layered with spices. So Joseph buys the linen. Nicodemus shows up with 75 pounds of spices that would be used to embalm Jesus' body. By the way, in in case you're taking inventory here, um, all evidence that Jesus actually died, you don't embalm a living body. If this is a hoax, you don't embalm it. You don't wrap it tightly in linen. You might loosely do it because you want him to be free when he comes out of the tomb. None of that transpires here. They're treating Jesus like he really died, okay? That you don't call a living body a corpse. 
That that's a word that the scripture uses on purpose, God inspiring every word to reveal truth to us that Jesus actually died. And so we put all of that together. Joseph buys the linen. Nicodemus brings the spices for him embalming, not John 19, 39. And they quickly take him down. They wrap him and embalm him and place him in the tomb. But time, because the sun is setting, Sabbath is beginning, would prevent them from finishing the job. So they have to cover the entrance to the tomb with a stone. And these two men, these two secret disciples, are left to grieve. In verse 47, we're introduced once again to two of the three women that are named at the cross. Who, they're standing outside the tomb, watching what's going on, taking inventory, seeing what's being done, taking note of where the tomb is so that they can come back on Sunday morning and finish the job. They know what they need to bring so that they can finish the work that did not get completed. They know where to go. There's a, a, a skeptic's claim that the two women, because of their grief, went back to the wrong tomb, and they found the wrong tomb empty because Jesus' body was never placed there. But they, honestly, even the most directionally challenged of us would know how to get back to a place we've already been, right? Especially if it's within walking distance of your house, okay? And so this sets aside all of those skeptics' claims and this lets us know that Jesus actually died. All of those details revealed in Joseph and Nicodemus giving Jesus a proper burial. And so now we've arrived at a place where all of these details can address the naturalist explanations of Jesus' death. And so if you're a naturalist, you know what that means? If you're a naturalist, that means that you, own, you do not believe in the supernatural. That, that only what science can prove and anything outside of natural law, thus the term naturalist, is to be uh, discounted and renounced because there is no scientific explanation for it. And so the naturalist explanation for Jesus' death is that he swooned. There's this popular uh, account, the explanation for Jesus' death that he swooned. It's called the swoon theory. It's actually... Uh, re gained some resurgence in recent years under a different name, the Passover plot. But they kind of both say the same thing. And it all comes from this naturalist explanation that Jesus didn't really die. So if you want a reference to go to an article that I will reference here, it appears on the Answers in Genesis website. It explains these two skeptical views, and so I want to explain them to you so that we can be equipped to answer people's questions. Because there are people that believe that Jesus was crucified, but that he didn't really die. Because if he, if he, if he died, then what do we do with the resurrection? But if he didn't really die, then we have a natural explanation for the resurrection. And so this, this time in the grave becomes incredibly important to the gospel narrative because Jesus actually died. But if you believe the swoon theory... Here's my best articulation, most simple articulation of what that means. The swoon theory states that Jesus did not actually die when he was, and, and what, when he was removed from the cross. Instead, he had fallen into a coma-like state, thus he swooned, in part because of that which was given him to drink, wine mixed with myrrh, that, which would have a narcotic-like nar narcotic effect. But you remember Jesus didn't drink that. That, he, that it was after payment had been made, after darkness hung over the, the cross for three hours, after God had justly poured out his judgment upon Jesus, when Jesus cried out his thirst and they gave him vinegar to drink. So he didn't drink the pain reliever. But So they believe anyway, long story short, that he had passed out. And thus they took him down, they buried him, and that, that after three days, in the, the cool air of the tomb, that, that he revived. And somehow, in spite of all of his injuries, managed to roll that stone away from the inside. Evaded the Roman guards who stood a century watch outside of his 
tomb. Then he appeared later to his disciples, proclaiming that he had conquered death only to succumb to his injuries sometime later and die and be buried in a secret grave that is unmarked and unknown even to this day. That's a stretch, isn't it? There is an enormous amount of mental gymnastics going on there to arrive at that conclusion. Let's pick up the Passover plot, which has kind of made resurgence kind of back in the late 70s, uh, or early 70s rather, late 60s. There was a book that was written by a radically liberal New Testament scholar named Hugh Seanfield, and his attempt to resurrect the swoon theory uh, had some modifications. Here's what he said. He proposed that Jesus set out to fulfill the Old Testament messianic prophecies, and, and to do that, he enlisted the help of Joseph of Arimathea, of uh, Lazarus of Bethany, of Nicodemus, and others to help him accomplish this elaborate hoax. That he arranged for an unidentified person to give Jesus a drink on the cross that would cause him to lose consciousness. We know that Jesus refused the narcotic and only drank the, the sour wine, vinegar. But he would lose consciousness because of what he drank. A and that... They would take him down, they would loosely wrap him in, in the grave clothes, that they would appear to embalm him, thus the 75 pounds of embalming spices and aloe and, and, and such. But, but they, would, they would set this up, so, and then the disciples would, would, would help in all of this, and that he would, would, would rise from the grave, quote-unquote, and appear to many under the guise that he had conquered death. There's, there's one crucial element of the story that we have yet to talk about. One crucial element of his treatment on the cross that we have yet to address. None of these naturalist explanations deal with it. We haven't even talked about it yet, and that is the spear in Jesus' side. Here's what happens when, when Jesus is, is, is stabbed, basically. That both the swoon theory and the Passover plot require Jesus somehow to survive the scourging and then the crucifixion and then three days without food and water and medical attention in a grave with no air. None of them deal with the spear in his side as well. So a couple of points here quickly. The Romans centurions that crucified Jesus over the course of their empire, hundreds of years, crucified hundreds of thousands of people. All of them died. Not one of them survived. There is no record of anyone ever surviving crucifixion in the Roman Empire. Not one. And so to think that someone could, could set aside everything that Jesus suffered leading up to the cross while he was on the cross, and then somehow revived from all of that after three days in the grave, either displays willful ignorance or it is a desperate attempt to deny the obvious. Furthermore, as I said a moment ago, it ignores the spear. These two naturalist explanations ignore the spear. Let's talk about that for a moment. Because this account is in John 19.34, and so the, the Roman centurion, at the Pilate's judgment, Nicodemus and Joseph all handle what the Bible calls a corpse, but the naturalists want to set that aside and say that somehow Jesus rose from the dead. So when we look at Jesus being stabbed with the spear, this unexpected detail, Lee Strobel points out in A Case for Christ that the shock that Jesus would have suffered from his injuries and the slow suffocation of death on the cross would have caused fluid to build up in the pericardial sac around his heart, and this would have been called pericardial effusion. That as he slowly suffocated, his lungs would have filled with the same kind of blood and water-like fluid, and, and that his abdominal cavity would have began to fill with this fluid called pleural, uh, if I'm pronouncing that right, effusion. So when the soldier comes to Jesus and they've broken the legs of the other two criminals so that they would quickly suffocate and die, they couldn't push up on their feet anymore to breathe, 
they find Jesus is already dead. And so instead of breaking his legs, there's no need, they take a spear and they stab him in the side. That spear would have been thrust up through his right side, through his right lung, into his heart. And so it would have come from this side, through this lung, and into his heart, kind of on a diagonal. And that makes sense from the ground up like this, right? You following me, the trajectory of that spear? Up through the body of Jesus, through his lung, piercing that plural sac, into his heart, piercing the pericardial sac, and all of that fluid that had pooled rushes out when the spear is pulled out. John's testimony describes what is consistent with what modern medicine would expect from the injuries that Jesus suffered. All of that implies is evidence that supports that Jesus had already died, right? But let's, let's just for the sake of argument, say that he hadn't died, that he had passed out. Well, now he's dead because his lung has been pierced and so too has his heart with a spear. Those are fatal injuries. You're not surviving that if you get stabbed in the heart with a Roman spear. Right? And so even if we are going to give them some room to suggest that Jesus somehow passed out, we cannot get around the fact that his spear was, or his side was pierced with a spear. John 19.34, if you missed that reference earlier. And so what do we do with all of these details that we've talked about? How do we put them all together? When we, when we look at all of this that, that, that the Bible describes with Joseph of Arimathea taking Jesus' body down from the cross and burying him with Nicodemus, sealing the tomb with a stone, what does that tell us? It's something that we've already arrived at, something that we've already said, but it underscores it for us. Sandwiched between the crucifixion and the resurrection is Jesus' burial in the grave. And that becomes a crucial, integral, essential part of the historical confession of the church. It's part of the gospel. And so that's what I want to talk to you about now, is that historical confession of the church. To that we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. And according to Paul, Jesus' burial... This is first century now, is a fundamental part of the gospel message. That it, that it forms part of the apologetic of the gospel. There the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That happened on the cross, right? That he was buried... That's what we're talking about now, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. We'll talk about that in the future. All of that forms an essential part of the gospel message. And that's what I want you to know. It is an essential part of the gospel. Christ died according to the predetermined plan of God on the authority of the scripture. Did that happen because God said it would happen? God determined it would happen. You could even say that God caused it to happen so that we could know salvation in Jesus Christ. It had to happen on the authority of the scriptures. That he was buried after he died to show the genuineness of his death and the authenticity of what would happen three days later when he would resurrect from the dead. Again, all of this happens according to the scriptures on the authority authorized by the power of the word of God. It's something to consider, loved ones. And so what, what Paul describes there in 1 Corinthians 15 forms one of the earliest known creeds in the Christian church. Christ died according to the scriptures. He was buried and raised in power on the third day, again, according to the scriptures. It's a systematized core belief. 
what we believe about the gospel. The Westminster Catechism, don't, don't shrink back from that word. Catechism is a teaching tool. It was instrumental in the days of the Res- Reformation. But interestingly enough, if we're talking about the historical confession of the church, we need to move forward just from the first century and talk about what happens later on in Christendom. The Westminster Catechism mentions Jesus' burial as substantiating evidence that he was, in fact, the Christ, that he died and was buried so that he could rise again. Right? We come to the Apostles' Creed. Something that, that, that came out of the Council of Nicaea and was kind of, again, back up and systematized, the systematized doctrine of the church includes it, the Jesus' death and burial as a foundational statement of Christian doctrine. That Jesus didn't pass out. He didn't lapse into a coma only to revive three days later that he died. It is essential that he was crucified and died and was buried in this burial three days in the grave. This interlude in the grave shows us that that is true, verifiable, authentic. Jesus died. And all of this sets up the resurrection. All of it tees the ball up, if you will, for the resurrection. That, that we need to be absolutely certain that Jesus died and was buried. So that the resurrection carries all of the certainty and veracity and hope that we have as Christians. Without it, listen to me, without it, the reliability of the gospel hangs in the balance. You know that? And so the, the amount of detail that we've described this morning and the way in which it was articulated does not suggest some elaborate hoax, but a faithful account of real events. And as I said, and it may be self-evident in your mind, but I can assure you that it is not in everyone's mind. Without real death, substantiated by an actual burial, there can be no real resurrection. And according to 1 Corinthians 15, if that's the case, we, of all people on planet Earth, are the most miserable because everything we believe and everything we hope in is not true if Jesus did not die and rise from the grave. Amen? This interlude in the grave then reminds us of what the gospel is. We know what it is. That Jesus, the Son of God, came in the flesh, lived the life that we could not, fulfilled the law in every way, died in our place so that we could be forgiven. He died and was buried so that he could rise from the grave, so that we just don't die to sin, but we could also become alive with him. This is the gospel. It's right here in the grave. It's an integral part of it. It also, my friends and my loved ones, tells us what it means and of the hope that we have in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know this isn't it. That there's no period after Joseph rolls the stone in front of the grave. That's not where the Gospel of Mark ends. That's not where Matthew ends his account of the life and times of Jesus. That's not where Luke ends. That's not where John ends. We have four credible witnesses that all tell us the same thing. Jesus died and was buried, and he rose again. The end of the story is not even the resurrection, but the ascension. Jesus is at the right hand of God today. And he is coming again. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Praise the Lord. We can't get there, though, without this three days in the grave. It is an essential part of the gospel. Jesus died and was buried so that in three days he could rise again. And so I want to do something a little different as we respond to what we've heard this morning.
We've got a meal, and um, we're going to take some time to get ready for that here. We've also got a song that we're going to sing here at the end of service, and we've got time. Don't worry. Look, it's five after. You're going to get out early today, so just calm down, okay? We're going to do something different. The prayer room is going to be open if you need private prayer, but I want us to do this. I want us to stand together as a church body. And the musicians are going to make their way back up to the stage so that we can sing one more time together. But I want to end our service by reading some of the historical confession of the church, a portion of the Apostles' Creed. Something we've never done, something I've never done as a pastor, but something we've never done especially as a church. But I want us to do that. This is going to be up on the screen. We're beginning in the second paragraph of the Apostles' Creed. And I want you to read these with me, okay? Read them out loud at the top of your lungs. Go slow so we we all can read it together, okay? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. God's people said, Amen. Let it be true, though every man was a liar. This is the confession of our faith.